Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar presentation, The Art of Winning in Patent Litigation, a Conversation. I am Gail Martin, Associate Marketing Manager at LexisNexis IP, and I want to cover a couple of things before we get started. Please feel free to submit questions during the conference by using the chat or Q&A feature. We will be sending you a copy of the slides and a link to the recording from today's presentation. I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Uh, Dave Stitzel. Dave is an IP cons solutions consultant with LexisNexis IP. Prior to this role, uh, Dave served as a licensed patent attorney as well as a former patent examiner with the USPTO. And uh, Dave is going to introduce uh, the co-presenter, Luke Anderson. And so thank you for joining today's presentation, everyone. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Dave. Oh, thanks, Gail. I appreciate that. And uh, as Gail mentioned, it's uh, with great pleasure that I'm actually joined by my very good friend and esteemed colleague, Luke Anderson. Uh, Luke is a patent attorney and a managing partner of the patent litigation firm, Atlanta Technology Law. Luke has earned the highest AV preeminent rating by Martindale Hubble, uh, has a superb AVO rating of 10, is recognized as a super lawyer, and is also listed among Georgia's legal elite. So what I'd like to do now is uh, advance this slide and just give a, a brief overview of kind of the flow of today's discussion. So what I'd like to do um, is start off with a few uh, preliminary questions, and then uh, once we uh, go over those, uh, we'll discuss how to do uh, or how to prepare for Markman hearing claim construction arguments, uh, how to identify potentially invalidating prior art references, uh, how to pinpoint potentially fatal uh, Section 112 errors, as well as identify tang uh, tangential issues subject to exploitation, uh, all of that from, a, uh, from the lens of a seasoned and very successful uh, patent litigator and uh, to a lesser degree uh, from my lens of uh, being a patent uh, prep and process attorney, as well as a former examiner with the USPTO. And then time permitting, uh, we'll also provide some additional uh, procedural insights. So with that being said, let me jump on to the next uh, slide, which is addressing the preliminary question. So uh, Luke, why is patent litigation important uh, from a business objective standpoint? And Luke, you might have to hit the star six to unmute. Dave, thank you for that kind sure, introduction. Um, turning to your question about patent litigation and business objectives, uh, I guess we start from the vantage point that litigation, more often than not, is an extension of a business's goals and objectives. When they cannot obtain those goals and objectives in the marketplace or through other means, litigation is frequently the tool that is employed in order to advance those further goals and, and objectives. This can be anything from fighting over market share. Uh, it can be an effort to engage in licensing negotiations. It can be uh, simply because the, the companies uh, have a long history in which they do not get along, and for that reason, the litigation is viewed as being the, the way to resolve some of those disputes. Right, and you know, at the end of the day, it oftentimes comes down to money, so you're, you're considering monetary damages and like you had alluded to, you know, injunction, injunctive relief and that sort of thing. The other thing I wanted to ask was what are uh, some of the statutory defenses to a claim of patent infringement? Well, your statutory defenses when you are defending in a litigation for patent infringement are spelled out by the code uh, under 35 U.S.C. 282, you have standard defenses of non-infringement, invalidity based on either prior art, invalidity based on your own prior use, uh, it could also be the use of others, or other defects such as 112 defects that could permeate through there. Um, there is certainly an ongoing trend with an ongoing dispute in terms of whether patent eligibility under Section 101 is considered a defense or not. 
That to me is perhaps a more scholarly issue in debate. All I can say is from the patent litigator's perspective, your district courts seem ready and willing to consider that issue at pretty much any stage of the dispute from an early motion to dismiss straight through to summary judgment. Um, Interesting. But those are, those are your main statutory defenses. You will always have other defenses that are available, uh, some of which could turn as you are a licensed party to use, and perhaps some of the, the other more common ones, such as inequitable conduct, uh, on behalf of the patentee. Yeah, and, and Luke, I just want to mention, and we'll, it's pretty obvious from from the uh, overview, but we'll we'll definitely take a deeper dive into some of those 112 issues uh, that can be raised as a statutory defense, uh, you know, to a claim of patent infringement. And we'll get into that uh, here in some future slides. But uh, moving on to the next question is how important is patent quality? Uh, from a number of different perspectives, and, and you don't necessarily have to address all of these, but, you know, just uh, kind of as uh, as a different lens is, you know, you've got capital investment, um, M&A, uh, maybe licensing and cross-licensing opportunities, uh, and obviously what we were just alluding to is post-grant uh, post challenges and assertions uh, perspectives. Patent quality is becoming an increasingly important issue for all patent holders. Um, a vast majority of my clients that I work with might have in-house counsel, but they might not have in-house patent counsel. And as a result, when patents issue, patents all look the same. They have the same cover sheet, the same formatting, they follow the same uh, style throughout. And as a result, it can be very difficult when you're simply looking at a patent to determine uh, you know, what is the quality of the patent? What is, you know, the quality of the citations there of prior art, the quality of the claims, but most importantly, the quality of the prosecution getting the patent issued. Because one thing that we know both as patent attorneys and as patent litigators is that how you arrived at the patent can be an extremely important piece and that is simply not reflected in the patent document itself. As we've seen in recent years, more and more capital investment, acquisition, and licensing is happening around the patent space. The old adage that patents have moved from the back room to the boardroom is extremely true. It used to be when we were connected with M&A types of deals and transactions, that frequently the patents were not subscribed much, if any, value in the transaction. That has certainly changed in recent years where you can have M&A deals and transactions that are almost exclusively around patent portfolios as opposed to business operations. And in that context, understanding if you've got quality patents, as well as claims that are enforceable to either defend your product lines or enforceable against third-party infringers is an extremely important piece. And there is more and more analytical work being done around those issues all the time. Sure, and one thing I would add to that uh, regarding the patent quality is you know, obviously it's, it's uh, you know, crux to many of the things we have listed there on, on the uh, slide, but uh, one of the things I think that is oftentimes overlooked is, you know, at the end of the day, patent examiners, uh, having been one uh, at the USPTO, they're under severe uh, time constraints, just as uh, most patent practitioners are, and it's, uh, it's, it's not infrequent that uh, they actually miss 112s inadvertently. And, and the point being is that obviously, uh, if you can go in with your best foot forward uh, at the outset prior to filing and draft a, uh, you know, a high quality, well tailored patent application, you can avoid uh, many of those 112 uh, issues downstream. But then also at the end of the day, if you don't put your best foot forward and, and catch those 112s prior to filing, and the examiner uh, overlooks them as well. At the end of the day, you might have a patent that's not worth the, with the, uh, worth the paper it's written on. So uh, just kind of a caveat uh, from a, a patent quality perspective. But uh, let me move on to the next slide here. So uh, with respect to uh, preparing for Markman hearing claim construction arguments, 
Uh, Luke, how do you typically assemble your claim construction arguments? For me, most of the time, the patent uh, terms that need construction have to be viewed both through the lens of the plaintiff trying to assert an infringement position. If you feel like your claim does not read uh, just directly on the device, you're evaluating whether or not you need to seek a construction that would offer you a slightly broader view of that claim, allowing it to read onto the accused device. The defendant is typically looking at the claim construction process through the lens of trying to invalidate the claims or through the lens of seeking to narrow the understanding of the claims in order to set up a non-infringement type of position. And so both parties are coming to the table looking to advance generally those types of issues through the idea of claim construction. Yeah, and that's a great point uh, that you brought up with respect to, uh, you know, potentially narrowing uh, interpretations. And I think that really leads well into the, the next series of questions uh, regarding uh, intrinsic as well as extrinsic evidence. And, uh, you know, obviously, uh, as you're well aware, uh, when you're interpreting the meaning of a claim term at issue, uh, you obviously turn to the intrinsic evidence. But, you know, there are times uh, where, where you might uh, rely on extrinsic evidence in the event that the intrinsic uh, evidence is somewhat lacking. So I'm, I'm just curious for, you know, based on your uh, experience and, and, and whatnot, you know, do you, uh, I'm, I'm assuming you probably don't uh, solely rely on intrinsic evidence, um, but how often do you actually turn to uh, the extrinsic evidence? And when you do turn to extrinsic evidence, what sort of uh, extrinsic evidence are you actually uh, looking to? I think my general vantage point is I use the resources that I need in order to make my case. The case law itself is rather expressed that it gives clear favoritism to intrinsic evidence over extrinsic evidence. I guess I have always viewed that as a little bit of a balancing act in the sense that I view it as kind of walking out onto a limb. If you go a little ways out, there's usually, you know, support for your weight, but the further you go, the more likely that limb is to snap out from under you and thus the support for what you are doing. The more extrinsic evidence you use and the more purposes that you use it for, I think the, the more likely you are to encounter problems in that area. The types of extrinsic evidence that I have used in the past has been anything from a subject matter expert to provide historical background and context to the invention so that it's understood kind of the incremental value that the invention is supposedly giving uh, to the idea that we've used uh, extrinsic evidence in terms of dictionaries or very industry-specific publications to provide context, background, and meaning to the claims or the invention or to help define a term in the context of the person of ordinary skill in the art of that field showing prior publications uh, as to how that term was used and understood can frequently be of benefit. You always doing that, that you know, you're taking a bit of a risk, but sometimes you need to do what is uh, permitted in order to make your arguments and offer your best advocacy position to the court or tribunal in order to, to get the construction that you need. Yeah, sure thing. And uh, kind of digressing back to the intrinsic evidence, uh, I'm assuming that one of the go-tos for uh, for arriving at uh, certain claim constructions that will benefit your client would be obviously turning to the spec, but uh, I think it probably goes without saying for most people in the audience that uh, you also want to turn to the uh, to the intrinsic record as it pertains to uh, the image file wrapper, uh, because oftentimes, as you're well aware, um, there could be arguments that you know may 
may end up uh, being uh, narrowing amendments and, and corresponding arguments that might lead to estoppel uh, for, for trying to, uh, you know, recapture a broader uh, claims uh, scope and interpretation uh, based on, you know, an amendment that uh, was enacted to try to, you know, secure an allowance. Um, any any comments on that? Or? Uh, absolutely right and well said. I appreciate that. Um, so just as a kind of a, a follow-up, what, what sort of uh, pattern or form uh, do your clean construction arguments typically take? I think one thing that you had mentioned uh, uh, prior to the call uh, was that, you know, normally you only go in with like three to five at most uh, terms that you're, uh, that are in dispute, um, you know, just to not overwhelm uh, judges, for example, I'm assuming, but um, what sort of uh, claim construction arguments on those four or five uh, do they, t uh, what sort of pattern or form do they typically take on those four or five uh, terms that are in dispute? Well, I guess I kind of start from the vantage point that good rules of good advocacy play out at all stages of patent litigation. And so anywhere you can find opportunity to simplify the issues, narrow the issues, and not overwhelm the court with uh, issues that really don't need to be there, that's vitally important. I have never met a judge yet that really enjoyed doing claim construction. They know and understand that it is a legal requirement, but I find few that take joy in it. Accordingly, you really need to know why you, you need the construction. Make sure that that can be clearly articulated if called upon by the court to so because only claims that must be construed or that are in dispute, the court truly needs to address. And for that reason, I guess I have just always viewed it as, you know, yes, we have to do claim construction, but the fewer claims that must be construed, the better uh, in terms of not overwhelming the court. In terms of the pattern that those uh, construction arguments take, I think it's it's kind of unique to each setting, I guess. You know, I've always simply kind of tried to state the issue, offer my proposed construction, and explain to the court why that particular construction is the most reasonable, and then in the replies, explain why my opponent's construction is not reasonable. Those, to me, are the canons of good advocacy. Uh, no, no great secret there. But the more you can do to simplify that argument on paper and then be ready with a good, clear, concise message uh, if the court decides to give you oral argument on the issue, I think that's absolutely critical. I appreciate that, Luke. Uh, moving on to the next slide, uh, when it comes to identifying potentially invalidating prior art references, uh, what sort of steps do you take to call out, uh, you know, useful prior art, whether it's, um, you know, patent literature or non-patent literature or, or both? Well, in terms of, you know, from the defendant's perspective, usually when you're trying to identify invalidating prior art, I generally start with the art that is cited on the face of the patent and the art that is flagged in the prosecution history as being the closest prior art. Um, that usually offers a good jumping off point. Uh, frequently we check the citations uh, that are shown on the closest prior art to see what's offered there. If we still don't feel that we have what we need, then I guess we, you know, we are engaging in patent searching for invalidating prior art, the 102E or what has traditionally been the 102E uh, category of prior art usually tends to be the most fruitful because, you know, frequently that was not in front of the examiner during the examination process. That, that those searches will continue either until we find what we need or we have exhausted the available avenues. 
I guess I've tended to do these types of searches in a sequential manner. After the patent uh, searching is done, if I haven't found what I need, then we go ahead and start with uh, the non-patent literature. Frequently that is aided by a consulting expert. And I start the discussion with my client in terms of products that are used in the marketplace that we might be able to use as prior art references as well. An earlier, earlier public use of, of inventions or similar inventions that we can use if we need to. But in terms of at least preference of, of evidence, I also kind of give preference to patents first, public literature second, and then third, the idea of prior used, uh, prior used products. Yeah, and I imagine when you uh, when it comes to the applicant's own uh, work uh, or prior art, uh, especially from a scientist uh, perspective, you know, you've got scientific journal article publications. You know, uh, I imagine it's probably pretty difficult to to hone in on uh, you know publications where they were a speaker at a conference and that sort of thing. Uh, but I'm sure you probably do look to that sort of thing for uh, you know invalidating uh, disclosures. Is that something you find? Troublesome uh, when you're trying to find that sort of prior art, if it exists. Well, you're you're absolutely right that that type of that category of art can be very fruitful, namely the applicant's own prior publication statements and presentations. I think with the advent of the internet, more and more of those materials are becoming available. But frequently, when we're litigating patents, they are older patents, and so we're looking back at a time period of more than a decade ago. And so finding, you know, invalidating prior art can always be difficult. And so, yes, we use internet databases, things like PubMed and others for a lot of those early types of publications, but sometimes we still have to do the footwork, namely try to find people from the industry that might have attended those conferences that might still have their materials, and that can be extremely difficult. Sure, and, and a follow-up, um, you know, obviously uh, when you're on the defense side of things, um, and uh, one thing I should mention is that Luke uh, represents clients uh, both as a plaintiff uh, and on the defendant side, so he's got experience on both and about, I think it was like 45, 55 if I'm not mistaken, but. You know, obviously, when you're on the defense side, uh, you're going to look for, for prior art references to the nth degree, especially if it's something that's super important to that particular uh, client uh, from a business uh, uh, model or objective standpoint. But, you know, when it comes to representing uh, the plaintiff, you know, I'm assuming you're probably not um, doing a whole lot of prior art research, or am I completely wrong on that? Are you trying to cover your bases first? Um, and to, to try to locate some of that, that that might be might not have been uncovered um, uh, by the USPTO examiner, for example. And I think yesterday uh, you had mentioned something to the effect of you know looking for certain hotbeds, uh, specific regions that are uh, you know hotbeds for certain types of technology. Uh, if you could elaborate on that. Well, from the plaintiff's perspective, I've at least always wanted to know. Do I think I have a good patent here before we wind up commencing litigation? Not everybody shares that view or that opinion. Everyone is aware that you have the presumption of validity. But in terms of doing just general due diligence, in terms of the assignments, verifying that the inventors that are listed are, in fact, inventors, verifying that you know, subject to some very pointed questioning that they have complied with their duty of good faith and candor to the patent office and that we don't have lurking problems has all been part of at least what I consider to be good background due diligence before filing a suit. Now, with that, I look at it and I believe that at least some measure of limited patent searching is, prior art patent searching, is a, and it comes really more from that historical 102E perspective of applications that could have been moving through the 
patent office about the same time as your application that the examiner might not have had a view of, but yet could still be invalidating prior art. In settings where we have difficulty, and I, this really comes more from the defendant's point of view, in situations where we have difficulty finding truly invalidating prior art, there have been several times that we have you know, been able to identify hotbeds of inventive activity around the world and look more specifically and concentrate our searches in those areas. For example, the solar power industry, heavy concentrations in Spain and China, you know, those become key areas geographically to be looking at if we are seeking invalidating prior art as it relates to solar technologies. Sure, and one of the things um, as a follow-up is, you know, obviously you're gonna, to, you're gonna search, uh, you know, uh, related family members, you know, uh, patent, patent applications or granted patents that are claiming benefit uh, to the same priority document. Um, but one thing that you had mentioned, um, you know, yesterday that I thought was intriguing was actually looking to, uh, I guess you would say, unrelated uh, family members in the sense that they're not claiming priority to the same, uh, uh, ben uh, claiming benefit to the same priority document, but um, those that are related in the sense of, you know, same applicant, whether it's inventor or assignee, uh, same technology. But uh, if you wanted to elaborate on that, I, I just thought that was an interesting um, uh, insight, uh, not only for uh, from an invalidating prior art reference perspective, but also uh, when it comes to uh, claim construction arguments and that sort of thing. Well, Dave, you raise a great point. And, you know, when you're playing defense in a patent infringement matter, you leave very few stones on in terms of your invalidity analysis. And when you have a party that is in a, the plaintiff's position that has a portfolio of multiple patents, it does up the level of evaluation that the defendant needs to be doing in terms of reviewing the similar applications, both that would have the similar assignee as well as similar inventors to see if there was, you know, the invention, how close the inventions were, was all the uh, accordingly, um, as well as, you know, were there arguments made in either parent or child applications or even closely related applications that you believe that you can bring to bear as an advocate to influence the, the issues and outcomes in your case. And sometimes there's nothing more powerful in an advocacy capacity than hearing the other party's own words uh, as it relates to their invention. It can cut both ways, but you're looking for opportunities to have those factors cut in your, in your favor. And just to put a bit of a, a former examiner spin on this, you know, at the end of the day, examiners are, uh, you know, they have a very limited period of time to conduct a prior art search. And so, you know, if it's a blockbuster drug, for example, uh, a lot riding on the line. Um, obviously, at that point, uh, you've got, uh, you know, litigators have the ability to spend, you know, exorbitant amount of time to, like you say, leave no uh, stone unturned. And um, oftentimes, I would imagine that, you know, when you have a granted patent and then there's other related family members or pending in other uh, countries or other patent offices, you know, sometimes I would imagine there would be a situation where, you know, maybe the original patent grants and they were unaware of the cited reference uh, because it wasn't cited at that point um, in time, but then maybe there's some, uh, you know, very good prior art that's covered by or uncovered by an examiner in another patent office. Uh, obviously, at that point, um, you know, it's, it's a great way to leverage, uh, if you're on the defense side, leverage some of that uh, newly uh, newly uh, discovered prior art uh, in your favor for uh, invalidity purposes. So uh, just for time constraints, let me go ahead and move on to the next slide uh, dealing with uh, pinpointing potentially fatal 112 errors. And, uh, you know, my first question is, do you typically uh, conduct Section 112 analyses uh, to identify uh, not only strengths but also weaknesses, both from a uh, plaintiff as well as a defendant perspective? 
uh, from a litigation perspective, I think 112 is, is an issue that looms large for both sides. And even the best draftsmen when it comes to preparing and, and prosecuting patents can still have trouble under, under 112 because what is clear to, to the draftsman can be unclear to others. And I think we all suffer from, from that type of uh, blindness to our own work product. And for that reason, it, it becomes very important to get input from others whenever possible when preparing claim sets, making sure that there is good and proper support for the claim elements that are in your, your claims in particular, and making sure that there is clarity in the claims as much as possible to avoid ambiguities. Um, you know, that's good patent preparation and prosecution 101. When it comes to litigation, yes, we always try to look for and find uh, 112 issues going in because that way we are assessing the strengths and weaknesses of our own position before we are in litigation. And as a defendant, we're doing it, A, because it can potentially drive invalidity issues, and it can also, you know, cause a court to start thinking, even if it's not going to drive an invalidity issue, can the construction that is used and determined around that claim drive other issues such as on infringement, or prior art in validity. And so, you know, you can use 112 positions from a defendant's perspective to try and help drive other determinative issues in the litigation. And I'm curious, um, you know, you touched on vague and indefiniteness, uh, you know, lack of sufficient written description, that sort of thing. But uh, I'm curious, uh, have you ever attempted to invalidate a patent based on uh, functional claiming where the specification failed to adequately disclose corresponding structure that accomplished the claim function. And I ask because, uh, you know, the first half uh, of the first day at AIPLA uh, last year dealt with functional claiming. And so I think it's one of those things where, uh, you know, patent practitioners uh, may may not use it as much as they, they used to, uh, but I think it is still used, uh, you know, on those special occasions. and. Uh, I'm just curious if, if you've ever tried to uh, attempt to, uh, you know, invalidate a patent based on that sort of uh, functional claiming uh, argument under 112.6. We've certainly teed those issues up, Dave, and, you know, have pressed those in litigation. We have not taken any of those issues uh, all the way to a judicial resolution. Uh, because I think, quite frankly, the stronger those arguments are, the more likely the parties are to, to go ahead and try to resolve the issues before a determination is made. But and so to your definitely. point, they, you know, they can be rather potent if they sure. are well framed from a defendant's point of view. Most definitely, most definitely, I appreciate that. So the uh, the next few uh, questions, or I'm kind of going to group them all together, just in the interest of time constraints. But you know, how how important are patent drawings in litigation? Uh, how do you typically use uh, patent drawings in crafting your arguments? Um, and then uh, third, uh, but not least, obviously, is you know when it comes to inconsistencies in the part name and numbers as they appear within the spec and the drawings. Um, you know, have you ever used those sort of inconsistencies uh, to attempt to render certain claim limitations vague and indefinite, uh, you know, for for uh, purposes of uh, trying to invalidate, uh, you know, a prior art patent? Patent drawings can play a important role in the litigation. The patent is a business document. The more you can do in that document to provide Clarity, which I believe is kind of the more modern view of, of what we are searching for in patent prosecution, the better. 
more often than not, the patent drawings are used as exhibits during Markman claim constructions, or at least they offer an opportunity to provide clarity uh, at that stage. Uh, you know, they're, they're available to be used at trial if and when they need to be. The patent is going to be in evidence, and so, uh, you know, that type of information is available to the, to the jury. But there, the old adage that a picture can be worth a thousand words is absolutely true. At point when the spec and the drawings do not align, either because of numbering or because of the discussion of, you know, what's supposedly shown but not there. It offers an opportunity if those, uh, if that misalignment also coincides with patent claim elements to show that there's an ambiguity as to what's going on. Because what you're saying is, is that the specification does not clearly provide support for the claim and, and or the support that it offers is not clear, it's ambiguous, it's confusing, and for that reason, we cannot determine what the meaning of the patent claim term is. And so those arguments can be, again, very potent if, uh, if you can align those types of issues. And so having proper alignment between the specification and the figure numbers is, is, an, is a critical issue, both from the patent draftsman's perspective in terms of uh, generating good work product, but also from the litigator's point of view of making sure from the plaintiff's perspective that you've got solid patent rights to sue upon, and from the defendant's perspective to see if you can drive any invalidity issues based on that. And uh, just uh, kind of as a follow-up, and, and this kind of speaks to, I guess, uh, best practices or suggestions, therefore, as well as, uh, you know, maybe pitfalls to be careful to avoid. Um, th this is kind of a, a good lead into uh, the question regarding whether or not narrowing claim amendments made during prosecution, you know, in response to 112 uh, rejections that could have otherwise been avoided uh, may give rise to prosecution history estoppel arguments. and. You know, uh, that kind of uh, alludes to, you know, putting your best foot forward, as I mentioned before, at the outset prior to filing your application. But just curious, you know, um, first of all, can they? And then secondly, have you ever, um, you know, uh, relied on such arguments, uh, you know, during litigation? Well, the, the general rule is patent amendments made during prosecution for purposes of patentability can give rise to an estoppel. And for that reason, if you have received a 112 rejection from the exam, that are made in response to that are potentially creating an estoppel issue for you later on. And so, you know, that dovetails, I think, with the earlier comments that we had shared regarding patent quality. A patent owner might not see those amendments uh, in the final resulting patent, but they are there in the prosecution history, which could potentially uh, limit rights down the road if the estoppel is a central issue in a later litigation. And so the more that can be done to draft in a way that would not uh, ensnare a 112 rejection, the better from a prosecution point of view. From, from a litigation point of view, sure. I mean, if, if, you know, if that is a, if the amended term that was amended is central to uh, an infringement determination, by all means, we would raise the estoppel issue to limit the scope of that claim as, as needed in order to advance uh, arguments. Great point. And the other thing I would add as well uh, from, from a prosecution standpoint is, you know, one thing that's oftentimes overlooked is, uh, 
you know, uh, filing a, a PCT uh, priority document and then going national stage into multiple countries. I mean, if you start out, you know, kind of the old adage, garbage in, garbage out, if you start out with a poorly written application at the outset, um, not only are you going to potentially uh, give rise to prosecution history estoppel arguments in the event that, you know, claim amendments uh, are made to address 112s during prosecution, but also the fact that, you know, uh, when, you, when you're going national stage into all these different countries, you've just now compounded um, the, the corrections and the potential, um, you know, uh, pitfalls uh, in each of those countries, whereas if you had started out um, with a, a very well-written application, uh, you know, at the outset with a PCT, for example, um, you know, you're going to minimize uh, not only uh, the time and the cost for addressing those issues in each of those individual countries, uh, but also avoiding some of those uh, pitfalls in the event that the uh, the patent does uh, get asserted. So, any comments on that, or before we move on? No, I think that's a that's a wise comment. Um, had not specifically thought about it from that perspective, but I think you're absolutely right, Dave. I appreciate that. Thanks, Luke. Um, let me go on to the next one here. Uh, so now we're, we're shifting gears uh, and essentially trying to identify tangential issues subject to exploitation. And I know we've covered some of the 112 first. Uh, I, won't, I won't beat that uh, dead horse. But um, when it comes to spotting the, the 112 first, like, for, for example, uh, um, uh, the introduction of uh, prohibited new matter, I mean, I imagine that's probably pretty tedious, right? I mean, you're having to go through... Uh, these specifications, which, as you and I are both well aware, these these uh, patent documents can be pretty lengthy, hundreds of pages in, in some instances. And then if you've got prosecution that's been pending for years, uh, that's a ton of prosecution history to try to sift through. Um, is, it, is, it, is it tedious? Is it time-consuming to identify those uh, instances of the introduction of, of new matter? I think it it is tedious. It is time consuming. Uh, you know, there might be other ways of doing this. I'm a guy of a certain age. I take the the specifications and run red line comparisons between them to see what the the differences are. You know, the time that I've encountered, uh, you know, kind of your traditional new matter uh, types of of issues is when you're dealing with priority applications and you're trying to figure out was there support in a previous application in order to support the earlier filing date. So clearly the idea of a red line comparison is a good first cut, but it still doesn't do away with the idea that you got to get in there and read the material because there is not a verbatim requirement such that you have to use the same words every time, but that certainly helps with a good initial cut. But you still got to read because the idea could be there expressed slightly differently. I mean, the common theme in so many of these issues is that patent litigation is a highly detailed subject matter and, you know, kind of both from the plaintiff and defense position, you got to be ready to live in the details and master those details if you want to be able to master your case. But the hallmark of the good litigator is being able to present those details in a clear and concise way to a judge or a jury that does not have your same level of skill and expertise and explain why these issues are important, such as new matter or priority applications. Yeah, so a couple follow-ups I just wanted to mention is a great point about, uh, you, know, prior, you know, being able to claim that, the benefit to that priority document. And uh, as a former examiner, you know, that's something that, that I always went to is, you know, go back to that provisional application to find out if they do in fact have uh, support uh, for, for those claim elements because, if not, um, obviously that opens up uh, the ability to, to apply some intervening references that uh, you would not have applied otherwise had you not, you know, done that extra homework and, and dug into that uh, provisional application, for example, to, to see if there is support um, for what's being claimed. And then kind of a, another follow-up uh, would be, you know, the ability to 
you know, identify uh, situations where there might be implicit uh, written support, you know, um, and maybe there's not explicit support, but uh, there could be some terminology that slightly varies uh, in the claims. And while it appears as though they don't have explicit written support for that particular claim element in the spec, um, you know, based on one of ordinary skill in the art, if you were to apply, uh, you know, a, a thesaurus, for example, uh, you would immediately recognize the fact that there is there is an implicit support, uh, which you know could obviously kind of save the day, basically, if if that's uh, what the opposing counsel is trying to hang their hat on uh, to invalidate your your claim. So, um, just a couple of thoughts there. So, um, when, when it comes to double patenting, uh, I'm assuming you probably rarely look into that uh, and investigate that when it when it comes to you know uh, trying to invalidate a. A patent, for example, um, you know, and it could be double patenting that uh, obviously wasn't raised uh, or caught by the examiner during prosecution. It's a rare issue, I think, from a defendant's point of view, but it can still exist. It still happens. I think in my career, I've only had one case in which we raised the issue from the defendant's point of view and uh, we did not prevail on summary judgment on that. And so, you know, it is a, it is a hard one to, uh, to support, but it can certainly be done through expert testimony and otherwise. Uh, it's just, uh, to your point, Dave, it's not nearly as common uh, perhaps in a litigation setting as it is uh, from, a, from a prosecution point of view uh, when you're you're actively prosecuting a family of patents. No, I appreciate that. Fair enough. Fair enough. So let me let me jump on to the next slide here, uh, dealing with procedural insights. And I think just due to time constraints, uh, we probably won't be able to hit all these. But um, Luke, are there uh, you know any one or two of these uh, that kind of jump out at you as being something you'd like to address? Um, you know, just before we move on to kind of kind of wrapping things up. Uh, from a litigation point of view, I always want to know in each litigation what issues is the judge going to be determining and what issues are am I going to be able to turn to the jury for resolution on. Uh, claim construction issues clearly are a judge issue. Most of your inequitable conduct issues are going to be uh, judge issues. Most of the other issues that we regularly encounter in patent litigation are going to wind up going to the jury. And so typically fairly early in a litigation, uh, I am you know, looking and interested in who my judge is, what other patent cases have they had, what types of rulings have they been making, both in terms of Markman the style of their Markman order? Is it a detailed order? Is it a summary order that merely says term one means fill in the blank without a whole lot of reasoning? Uh, and I'm interested in what we know about jury selection, who is possible to sit on a jury, what types of juries do we typically get in an area, and what do we know about recent verdicts usually going back probably about two to three years in, in any given jurisdiction so that we have a sense of not only the legal issues that permeate our case, but what we know about each of the decision makers that are going to be connected with those issues. That does not always uh, you know, render clarity, but at least we can look for patterns and trends and be better informed about the, the, the litigation process if we are ultimately going to try the case and require the judge and or jury to, to render its opinions about our case. I appreciate that, Luke. And, and uh, you know, I, I'm going to ask this question. It's the last one. Uh, and I was asking uh, that primarily for my own benefit. We touched on it. Uh, here recently, it's just due to my lack of transactional uh, experience, uh, having focused primarily on patent prep and pros and examination. But you know, one of the questions I had was, uh, you know, when do licensing and cross licensing uh, licensing discussions typically come into play 
and you know, I think that maybe others in the audience that don't have a significant amount of transactional experience might benefit from that question as well. Well, I think, Dave, one of your early questions back to, to slide one talked about the interplay between a business's goals and objectives and litigation. Frequently, we see litigation as an extension of a licensing discussion, and frequently, even when that's not the case, we see litigation that winds up getting settled pursuant to a license. There are numerous ways to settle any lawsuit. That can involve the payment of fees, it can involve injunctions, it can involve licensing. And so patent litigation is just an area that is uh, kind of ideally situated for licensing discussions to be part of any litigation. It doesn't mean that that is an essential term of a settlement, but it's usually one of the terms that the parties at least discuss. It doesn't mean that it's acceptable to both sides. And so, you know, if there's going to be a settlement of a case, licensing is usually at least one of the topics that is discussed. Clearly, if there's interest from both sides, then you move forward with that. If not, it falls out of the settlement discussions. Thanks, Luke. And uh, one, one final question before I move on to the, the final slide would be, uh, how do you uh, see the role of big data in patent litigation uh, processes? You know, for example, like Mark Manier and claim construction, any, anything to that effect. It, how do you see the role of big data moving forward, especially with AI and that sort of thing? Well, uh, I at least see uh, more data being assembled and more data that is available to me as a litigator to help inform decisions throughout the litigation process, such as selection of venue, backlog of, of dockets in any given jurisdiction, number of patent cases pending in any given jurisdiction, time from the filing to the markman, time from filing to a uh, bench trial or a jury trial, straight through to once the judge is assigned, what do we know in terms of the number of Markman hearings he has had, how he has handled summary judgment proceedings, uh, right on through to how that particular judge has handled trials. And so we are, as litigators, we are becoming better informed about the judicial process in a quantitative way Whereas historically we might have been informed from a uh, qualitative way, if I was thinking about filing a case in Denver, I might call somebody that I know in Denver and ask them, "What do you think about your judges in the you know the Denver area for handling a patent case? You know what's the activity?" But there was never much data that was available for that. As the data becomes increasingly available, I think it does impact the way that we practice law based on the available, the information that we have available to us in order to make decisions throughout the process. I appreciate that. And, you know, one of the things that immediately jumped out in my mind is, you know, I know that you're the uh, the author of Anderson's Annotated Local Patent Rules for the Northern District of Georgia that summarizes and analyzes uh, cases applying district court local rules and patent cases. But it's it's kind of a, a, another step, as you kind of alluded to, in the sense that being able to uh, you know get a determination or a sense of how uh, judges have, have acted on certain patent cases in, in the past, and you know, obviously. Uh, past performance is a good indicator of uh, future performance, and so uh, it's kind of taking that another another step and be able to apply that to different, uh, you know, jurisdictions and, and, and uh, districts and whatnot. So, uh, in interesting uh, reply. So, uh, kind of as a um, as a, a conclusionary uh, um, uh, slide, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, at the end of the day, I'd be remiss if I didn't at least mention that we do offer. A, um, a solution is called uh, 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 LexisNexis Patent Optimizer for litigators, 
and it enables patent practitioners to conduct uh, better pre-litigation and litigation analyses to achieve better outcomes. And we do that in a number of different ways. For example, uh, we allow a patent practitioner to generate a customizable summary report that quickly identifies potentially fatal 112 errors uh, of an asserted patent or a patent that uh, is being considered for assertion. So, you know, identifying your strengths and weaknesses, uh, kind of like what we discussed before, uh, prior to filing a case of infringement is, is obviously a good thing. Uh, and then also uh, our ability to allow the uh, subscriber to generate a customizable term analysis report. And what that does is provides uh, the meaning of claim terms at issue based on uh, extrinsic evidence as well as intrinsic evidence with an emphasis on patent uh, prosecution history, uh, file history data. And then also, uh, you know, by, by uh, virtue of our relationship with LexisNexis, uh, you also have access to patent cases, uh, and that includes uh, LexisNexis federal case law, uh, such as uh, U.S. Supreme Court, CAFC, and federal district court decisions, uh, as well as administrative rulings from the uh, PTAB and BPAI. Uh, but those uh, patent cases uh, are cases where the court, in their opinion, actually construed the meaning of the claim term at issue, as well as claim term meanings presented by the litigants, so you have uh, access to all of that as well. And then uh, last but not least, the ability to identify related as well as alternative terminology used by other patent attorneys and lexicographers, and you would do so by leveraging our Elsevier's Compendex Engineering Thesaurus, uh, our Matthew Bender Attorney's Dictionary uh, Patent Claims Treatise, as well as our proprietary Patent Thesaurus and, and Profanity Dictionaries uh, when it comes to identifying some of that patent profanity like vague and indefinite uh, claim language, uh, claim language uh, that might be functional but lacking support within the spec for or structural variants that accomplish that claimed functional language. So with that being said, um, let me jump on to the uh, uh, next slide, which is uh, Maria's, uh, Marina, uh, my colleague, that you can reach out to if you are interested in learning more about that solution. And then uh, last but not least, I just wanted to say thank you so much um, uh, to both the audience for taking the time to, out of their busy day to attend today's webinar, uh, but also to, to you, Luke. Uh, I know that uh, you know you typically have around five or six active uh, litigation cases at any given time, so I want to say thank you uh, so very much for your time today and, and, and the time you spent preparing for the webinar. Dave, it's always good to connect with you. Thank you, sir. Thank you much. So, um, Gail, were there any questions that uh, may have came through? No, Dave, I think you addressed uh, the questions that, that arose, and okay. so we'll give everybody back just two minutes or three of their day. And uh, again, I echo the thank you for, for joining, and thanks to both of you for uh, the informative presentation. Thank you much. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Luke. Bye-bye. Bye now.